What is your level of optimism for the future? According to sociobiologist, futurist, and author Rebecca Costa, we have much to be optimistic about. However, this doesn't mean leaders and organizations should sit back and wait for a better future. Instead, the time to act is now. And this is what I think the new modern leader has to be sensitive to, is you don't want to prepare yourself necessarily to be able to meet the change. You want to either be the change or get out ahead of the change. Rebecca DeCosta is an American sociobiologist and futurist. She is the preeminent global expert on the subject of fast adaptation and a recipient of the prestigious Edward O. Wilson Biodiversity Technology Award. Her career spans four decades of working with founders, key executives, and venture capitalists in Silicon Valley. She has written two critically acclaimed books, The Watchman's Rattle and On the Verge. And her work has been featured in the New York Times, Washington Post, USA Today, and other leading publications. So, ready to explore why you should remain optimistic for the future, even through potential signs of societal collapse? Yes, that's deep. Let's discuss. I'm Rebecca Scott, and this is Humans Now and Then. Rebecca Costa, thank you for joining me. Well, thank you for having me. Well, I'm absolutely thrilled to have you on. Your books, The Watchman's Rattle and On the Verge, uh, challenge people to ask really hard but important questions about the future, especially when we think about it from a human behavior context or a historical context. Um, and of course, these are important things to consider in today's world uh, when we've experienced significant uh, disruption due to the global pandemic. When we look at it from the lens of an organization, uh, you and I have talked about the importance of companies being able to remain nimble and adjust to rapid change or disruption, which is consistent with some company cultures, but not as much for some others. So let's start there. What are some of the challenges or barriers that organizations face when they're trying to stay nimble? And what should they consider in order to you know, adapt and adjust during times of disruption? The real obstacle and the biggest obstacle that any organization faces is that we're Pavlovian by nature. It's in our DNA. We're designed by nature to repeat doing the same things that made us successful in the past because we get rewarded for that and then we become entrenched in that. And that leads to something that I call institutional resistance. And what all institutional resistance is, is that the organization has designed itself and institutionalized the repetition of what has made them successful in the past. And so this is always what you're up against. Now, some people uh, mistake that with corporate culture. And let's talk about two different things. One is corporate culture. And, and corporate culture, we've studied that for many, many years. Uh, excellent professors in business have studied this. And the corporate culture comes from the founders. So the corporate culture at Walmart comes from Sam Walton. The, the corporate culture at Apple Computer came from Steve Jobs and Steve Wozniak. And that doesn't change that corporate culture remains, even though the company changes its products, its technology personnel come and go, logos and taglines come and go, but the culture within the company doesn't change. It, it doesn't really fundamentally evolve. But we have to understand that that's different from institutional resistance. Institutional resistance is a result of repetition that has led to the success and growth of the organization. And that is separate from culture because the technologies that you're going to use, the scientific breakthroughs that you're going to leverage, the consumer trends and customer trends that you're going to tag onto, those must change. And so while the culture can remain consistent, the actual methodology in which you're going to deliver your products and services have to remain nimble and you have to design your organization in a way in which it can pivot on a dime. Right. And that can be a significant challenge for leaders that are trying to meet potentially huge goals in relation to delivery or product delivery, or even as we mentioned, and we had a conversation yesterday about the manufacturing environment and finding ways to adjust and evolve uh, given a significant requirements in relation to delivery. And so how does an organization shift from that kind of that mode of focusing on delivery, focusing on consistency, focusing on efficiency? 
and kind of looking past that short term potential for disruption into the future a little bit to look for longer term benefits for their organization? Well, you bring up a good subject. It's a sore subject for me because manufacturing doesn't like innovation. They don't like anything about innovation and new things because fundamentally the people that are running manufacturing in any particular company, they're rewarded on production and efficiency. And anytime you introduce anything new, efficiency is going to go down, right? So you might have a factory that has to change tooling or uh, you might introduce a new in, a new food ingredient that requires additional handling or additional drying time. You might introduce additional viscosity that the manufacturing line can't handle. You know, anytime you're introducing anything new for research and development or for marketing, even a packaging change, it means having to retool. It might mean losing some of its efficiency because the ultimate goal for manufacturing is to produce the same product as many as you possibly can get off the line without problems, right? So to maximize uh, what's coming off the line, and in order to do that, you need to be producing the same thing over and over and over again at lower costs. And most uh, heads of manufacturing are incentivized to do so. They're not only their salaries and their ability to be promoted, but, but also their bonus structure and all of that, which is fundamentally out, not in line with innovation and keeping pace with trends and wanting to be able to make quick changes. So, you know, many times when I'm consulting with large global corporations and organizations, the manufacturing people think, see me as an enemy because I'm trying to get innovation to move much faster and for companies to be able to move more, more nimbly. And so, you know, that's generally a, a real problem. Now, if your manufacturing organization becomes too powerful, in a particular organization, a very weird phenomenon begins to occur. And that is that the inside people that are working in research and development will begin to reverse engineer from whatever your manufacturing capabilities are because they don't want to see their ideas die in manufacturing. So this puts a real cap or inhibits innovation in a way that's very significant, particularly if your manufacturing facilities might be 10, 20, 30 years old you effectively have people trying to come up with innovation that can be produced efficiently at maximum quality without, you know, slowing down or affecting the number of units that come off a line of a 40 or 30 year old manufacturing plant. So you can get these weird phenomena where you have entire research and development organizations being held captive by, you know, antiquated manufacturing facilities. And I've run across this more times than I can say. Yeah, and that's a fascinating dynamic um, when you think about kind of, I guess, covert innovation, right? <laughs> Having to run under the radar and find these opportunities, but feeling a little bit constrained in the ability to be able to realize the potential benefits of those um, innovative ideas or approaches without the company really giving that leverage to take some risk in, in determining if it might benefit the organization. Well, that's true. But I, I, I would also say it's not just manufacturing. Right. Many times on the marketing side or the sales side, they don't want any new innovation to cannibalize their existing product line from which they're earning revenue, particularly if it's a big revenue maker for them. So, you know, the risk that uh, the new thing might not work as well as the old thing, even though the old product or service isn't producing as well or isn't, uh, you know, enjoying the margins that it once did when it was first introduced, you'll find that many sales departments and marketing departments are also resistant to change because what they ideally what they want is they want something that poses no risk to current revenue streams and current products. But we all know that one of the definitions of true innovation is it will always cannibalize an existing product or service. In my book, I kind of lay out you know, 10 or 20 litmus tests for how you know if it's really innovative or not, or if it's just a line extension or an incremental market-driven change that's not defensible. And one of the things is, is generally it has something to do with regulations, government regulations. Another thing is, is it takes a long time to develop. A third criteria would be that you can protect it, you know, and can you legally protect it might be an indication that it's a, a true innovation or not a true innovation at all. So there are some criteria that distinguish just, you know, what people say is new 
everything new is not an innovation, I guess. And that that's something that people should understand better. Oh, yeah, that's definitely true. I think one of the things that folks struggle with thinking about relation to innovation, like a lot of companies, as you're aware, and probably a lot of listeners are aware, have these strategic innovation initiatives where they're trying to boost innovation. And they usually run across a couple problems. It seems it seems around what I've identified. One is the definition that they use for innovation, as you bring up. What really is an innovation? And then also kind of what what are you doing within your environment to allow that innovation to not only kind of rise up and those ideas to be shared and discussed, but also what are you doing to ensure that those things can be implemented or tried in a way to figure out if there's a way to realize the benefits of those potential innovations in your organization? That's right. I mean, there's first of all the definition and second of all, it's effectively, you know, what is going on in the company that's going to either embrace innovation or become immovable obstacles. And, you know, part of what my job is, you know, when I'm consulting with large corporations is to find what those obstacles are and then bring them to the surface so that everybody's aware of them. And then try to work together to figure out how to remove those because that's how corporate culture changes. Corporate culture doesn't change because you hire a consulting organization that comes in and says, hey, I can make your culture more nimble. You know, this has been studied. It changes when you say, what is it about our culture that's preventing us from doing X? And once you answer that question and you remove that obstacle that's preventing you from doing X, corporate culture follows. So it doesn't evolve on its own. It evolves because you remove obstacles that are preventing you from moving forward. Oh, absolutely. And I think one of the things that's really interesting to think about, too, I mean, we all know that we're in this place of rapid change or have been for some time. And as innovation comes about, you think about disruptive innovation. We know disruptive innovation will happen. I think a lot of organizations need to think about it from this way. That disruptive innovation will either come from inside of your company or it'll come from outside of your company. So what would you prefer? That's exactly right. Uh, But I think you have to prepare for both. Yes. Because you don't have the R&D resources, no matter how big you are. And believe me, I work with the world's biggest companies. No matter how big you are, you don't have the resources to be everywhere. And proof of that is nobody has more resources than Google or Johnson & Johnson. And even they have to go out and acquire companies on a regular basis. If you look at their acquisition strategy, you know, it's, it's pretty daunting how many companies that they acquire. And, and, and their belief is that there are these little skunk work operations, right, that are popping up all over the place and they can't possibly cover the entire universe of innovation. So they're constantly on the hunt for what's the next disruptor and how do we seize it? early on and and allow it to operate at a slight distance from the mothership. So when you look at these acquisitions, they don't get completely pulled into the uh, Google corporate culture for some time. They're allowed to operate uh, pretty autonomously for a very long time until they sort of reach some maturation stage. Yeah, absolutely. And that acquisition strategy is something that a lot of large organizations are ramping up as a part of their innovation strategy. And sometimes I think maybe some of a realization that it takes some time to be able to cultivate that innovation within large, uh, longstanding organizations, uh, because they're really, as you mentioned, would require a cultural shift that is very difficult or sometimes impossible to achieve. And through acquiring smaller companies that are potentially more nimble, gives them that opportunity to have access to new innovative products or ideas that may not be generated within their own walls. Yeah, that's part of institutional resistance as well, because as you become a bigger and bigger company, you have more and more people and the job definitions and responsibilities get narrower and narrower. And we are all born with a certain amount of territoriality in our DNA. So it, it, it's scary to think that you're going to subcontract out or that you're going to acquire or whatever. But the most flexible and the most innovative companies are not concerned with not invented here. You know, they have their eye on a goal, on something they want to achieve, and they don't care how they get there. And they don't care if it requires going to a third party manufacturer or it requires, you know, acquiring a company or collaborating with a competitor 
all those options are on the table, whatever's the most efficient way to get there. And you see that Elon Musk is very much a really huge innovator because he doesn't have any ego. You know, Tesla doesn't have to make it. If you can show me that someone else can make it better, I'll acquire them or partner with them or license their technology or whatever. You have so many options open. And what gets in the way is that people feel like their job might be eliminated. Jobs don't tend to be eliminated when you work with outside partners. They just tend to change in their nature. Right. And you brought up an interesting point there that's based on fear, right? So a lot of organization, especially organizational cultures that I guess are resistant to change, uh, there usually is an aspect to fear of um, something new coming along, maybe disrupting a product that folks are working on, maybe disrupting a, a project, maybe putting their jobs at risk. How much do you think that fear is a deterrent to innovation? Well, if you were to go to any executive and ask them if they were making any particular decision out of fear, the answer 100% of the time would be no. <laughs> and, and this is where, as a sociobiologist, you know, I have to uh, differ with the data because I know better. I know that buried in the DNA of every living human being is a desire to protect territory. We are a troop dwelling organism. This is how we, you know, evolved. You take troops of bonobo monkeys with which we share over 97% of the same DNA and you look at how they operate, you know, in the natural environment. The only time that they will show uh, aggression is when someone's trying to invade their territory. And the reason for that is because within that physical territory in nature is everything they need to survive, all the food and water and other items that they need to be able to thrive. So in modern societies, we're not living in the jungle and we're not trying to defend necessarily a physical territory, although you know, there's a reason there are fences around most people's houses, right? <laughs> And, you know, they, they feel uh, encroached upon if a stranger walks up on their porch. That's why we've got the ring doorbells, right? We want to defend our territory. And that's how the ring doorbells, you know, it taps into this primal drive that all humans have. Many times, you know, I, I'm talking to an executive and they say, yeah, but, you know, we're not really that territorial and, and they don't believe me. And so I always give them this experiment. I go, do you do any grocery shopping? And most of them say, yeah, I kind of sometimes I go to the grocery store and I go, look, let me save you a lot of time. Instead of going up and down the aisles with your cart, just get a, get a basket and go straight to the checkout line and shop out of other people's carts because almost everything you need, they have in their carts, milk, cereal, whatever. And they go, I'm not going to do that. And I go, well, they haven't paid for it yet. So it doesn't belong to them. So just, you know, take it out of their cards in, in the checkout line. And, and I said, what do you imagine would happen? And they said, well, people would get mad. They'd call the manager. And I said, what's the manager going to do? They haven't bought it yet. It doesn't belong to them. And I said, if you really want to know about territoriality and humans, all you have to do is go into a grocery store and reach into someone else's cart down one of the aisles. And they'll go, what are you doing? And then if you explain to them, well, but that doesn't belong to you. The cart doesn't belong to you and neither does the food in it. They will have a connection fit and probably turn into a physical fight. Now, that's not a very rational position, right? You'd like to think you're rational, but the fact is that there are many prehistoric drives which drive our decisions, which are unacknowledged. And so territoriality and fear inside of the workplace uh, trying to protect by means of survival is a perfectly normal reaction. And so many more decisions are made based on fear than you than we can than we acknowledge in the workplace, particularly depending on what the culture is like. And I can tell you that there are cultures where the founders ruled by fear. Right. And I can tell you who they are because I, I worked for some of those people. Larry Ellison of, of Oracle Corporation, Steve Jobs, the Steve Jobs I knew at Apple Corporation, was very much uh, a person that ruled by fear. I mean, la in later life, he matured as a manager and became a much better leader. But uh, early on, you know, as Apple was becoming Apple Computer, it was a really fear based environment. 
uh, and Oracle Corporation as well. So that kind of dominance and publicly humiliating people, which was sort of the name of the day back in the 80s and, and 90s, you know, when I was working with these corporations, that was just sort of built into the culture. And so you better believe people were making decisions based on fear. Absolutely. I got to say, I love that grocery store analogy, and I will definitely be using that. I'm more than happy to credit you with that, but that was amazing. <laughs> um, but we have all experienced, I think, that human nature aspect within the workplace, uh, but we tend to, I think, underestimate or undervalue the importance of understanding our human nature. So thank goodness for sociobiologists like yourself, uh, but also I keep advocating for the rise of anthropologists too. This time we're dealing with significant societal change. How do we leverage our understanding of our human nature better instead of denying it or thinking we're overcoming it or we've evolved out of it? recognize it and think about that in relation to how we work, how we live, or how we think about solutions for the future? Well, it's very interesting because we expected to take care of all those human emotions and everything by putting together HR departments. And and HR departments really, <laughs> that's not where you go to try to resolve these prehistoric human drives and how they accelerate or interfere, you know, with the progress of a company. But uh, on the positive side, I'm going to say two things. One, never before have I had more offers to consult with boards of directors of large oil and gas companies, computing companies, you know, uh, retail companies. And the fact that they're reaching out to sociobiologists is already a, a good sign <laughs> that they're realizing that there are some underpinnings of the way that decisions are made in organizations form. That, that's one thing. The second thing I'll say is, look, the, the, territoriality is not a good thing inside a corporation. It needs to be addressed and it's fairly easy to spot. I have simple litmus tests that I give corporations and they, they kind of smile and go, actually, it works, you know. But there's also a number of evolutionary instincts, if you will, uh, which really help us. And, and we're finding that right now in the middle of COVID-19, as an example. And that is that when there is a danger that's larger than any particular individual, we have a natural tendency to immediately collaborate. And, that's, and, and that comes from our evolutionary history of being a troop-dwelling organism. Uh, as a troop-dwelling organism, it allowed us to defend against a danger or a threat or a predator that, as an individual, we would have had a hard time uh, fending off. So as a group, we knew that we were stronger and more powerful and we could defend against uh, you know, large threats that were larger than any particular individual. That's very, very important because when a corporation uh, encounters crises or a society encounters crises, you see immediately, instinctively, we begin to collaborate, which is why we love these movies. You know, everybody flocks to the movie theater for these big summer blockbusters where like a meteor is going to hit the earth and then, you know, all the countries get it together, right? Because the entire earth is going to be threatened or Martians, you know, uh, attack the earth. And, and suddenly there are no wars because the, the leaders of every country are collaborating. Um, unfortunately, the sad part is we have to have this sort of universal threat that's going to threaten all of humanity before we can get rid of wars <laughs> and have leaders cooperate. I hate that we have to have that external threat. But you see people collaborating when, you know, there's a terrorist organization that's threatening multiple countries that might not otherwise be collaborating. They begin to collaborate. And the same thing happens to corporations when they feel a direct threat. You'll find that internally they'll begin to collaborate um, more than they ever have before. Yeah, I think we've all experienced some level of that, you know, through life and over time. You think about 9-11, how a lot of folks in the United States really came together to cope and move forward from that tragedy. But whenever something highly disruptive comes about, we definitely have recognized that um, where people start to come together and coalesce around moving forward and find some level of unity, and which is really a fascinating thing, um, whether it be within organizations or out in society. I think that's one of the things that is interesting about how we respond to complexity. And I know that in, um, I think it was the Watchman's Rattle, you had talked a lot about 
cognitive threshold that we face is that we we reach a certain level of complexity. Our brains have a very difficult time kind of adjusting to that situation that we're in and when we have multiple things going on. So here in the U.S., of course, beyond just a COVID-19 We've had a significant amount of um, social unrest. Um, We've had a lot of organizations struggle, a lot of people losing their jobs, a lot of things going on in society. And for multiple people, there's a lot of things that they feel like they're hitting them left and right. How close are we at this point in time to that cognitive threshold? Or really, is that coalescence, us kind of coming together to solve these big problems, is that the thing that helps us move forward past this time and continue to thrive? Well, as you know, in the Watchman's Rattle, I became fascinated with how people, the the person on Main Street was behaving prior to the collapse of previous societies. I, I think historians have more than covered what the triggering mechanism was for the fall, the collapse of the Roman Empire or the Egyptian Empire, the Khmers, the Ming Dynasty. Um, but what I was interested in is were the people the everyday people, were they behaving in any way that made them vulnerable to collapse? Not so much the triggering event. And I discovered that there were three phases that the, that, that marked early signs that, that a unilateral collapse of their institutions was inevitable. And this happened in every single society that grew to be a great society and then very quickly unraveled. Um, and uh, I mentioned a few of them. The, the first is, is that the complexity of their social systems and the data that they needed to understand started to get too, uh, too difficult for the person on the street to understand. So whereas they might have been going to a well to get water for a period of time, soon their water was coming from some centralized water distribution system and then that water distribution system was being fed by some, you know, dam and hydraulic engineered system. And it, and it became more and more and more complex and far removed. Their financial systems, the same thing, you know, where they, whereas they used to barter in the street, suddenly they had currency and currency had shifting values, right? And, and, uh, and it was different from trading with gold. And, and then the relationship between gold and silver and currency had to be straightened out and the government had to put in regulations and lo- and lending had needed laws and regulations like usury laws. And so it got more and more complicated until suddenly you have Wall Street where you have, you know, credit default swaps that nobody and even the financial experts can't explain. And then the third uh, problem, so so complexity starts to grow to a point where the person on the street can't understand what's going on. So then the second stage emerges. And the second stage is that people can't really distinguish and don't have the capability to make a separation between what is an unproven belief and what's actually a fact, an empirical fact. And there's a mass confusion uh, amongst the, the greater population about what is factual and what is unproven. And then the third stage is that that creeps up into leadership and that the leaders eventually begin to forge public policy based on unproven beliefs rather than empirical facts because they themselves cannot cut through the complexity and do not have the knowledge to forge policy. Now, by the time that third stage is reached, the society or the organization, this doesn't just apply to societies, is now vulnerable for some triggering event to cause it to unravel very, very quickly. And by collapse, I don't mean everybody in the society or the organization just dies out. Uh, What I mean by that is that collapse is a reversal to systems that our brains understand. Because think of it this way, uh, the clock of evolution moves very, very slow. When I'm driving my car today, I could use about 10 other appendages, right, to be able to use my nav system and drink my coffee and check my phone. And, you know, I want to do all those things at one time. And we've had to now put laws in place to say, you know, you're driving a 10 ton vehicle. No, you know, keep your eyes on the road and your hands on the steering wheel. So uh, I'm short appendages right now. And, And if you think about physiologically, 
you know, it's very hard to keep up with all the data that's showing up on your phone and everything you should know to make a decision about how you invest in Wall Street and which insurance company you should be picking. And, you know, we're all walking around kind of knowing that we didn't make the optimal decision because there's too much data and we can't we don't have the time to go through all of it. So we're already kind of through that first stage and that second stage where we can't tell a fact from a, an unproven belief. We've kind of gone through that as well because we're, we're finding that for every study that says one thing on the internet, there's 10 that say something else. And we're finding that even presidential candidates are saying conflicting things. We don't have the ability to really go through and discern which is the right thing and which is the wrong thing. And so people are easily swayed by what an authority figure just says. We just assume it's it's got some factual basis to it. And then, you know, we're now moving into this third stage where we have the leaders of our organizations, the top organizations in the world and the leaders in the top nations of the world forging public policy when, you know, they really don't have the background to do it. And so as a result of that, they're kind of forging irrational policy. And, and you can see that, you know, none of them are doctors. There's nobody that, that's a doctor, but they're forging healthcare policy. And None of them have ever taken a course in physics, but they have to decide on uh, nuclear safety, even though they don't understand, you know, anything about nuclear arms. So you have this bifurcation that occurs between people that are experts and knowledgeable and the uh, politicians that are running a society. And you can see this over COVID-19. There's a clear split between science and politics on how COVID-19 is being run. Absolutely. I was just thinking through all those parallels and you started walking through them. And I think that's something that we've all seen. And it doesn't really matter, I think, where you fall in the political spectrum. I think we all feel uh, some aspect of what is really happening. How do we understand the the truth? Um, and that might come down to, too, whether it be in society trying to shape policies or within organizations determining how to respond or prepare for the market. You know, one way you can do that, of course, is to look at trends. A lot of the trends based on previous data, of course, was only as good as the data was in the past. And now we've um, experienced some very significant disruption in our environment that may have altered the potential trends that are, you know, based on the stories that might have been told from that data in the past. Are there opportunities for us to think differently about leveraging what we know or what we've learned over time to help us do better predicting, you know, how do we move forward from this place? Then also, how do we better prepare for the next uh, global pandemic or the next significantly disruptive event in society? Well, the tools that we have that previous societies didn't have, you know, and they all collapsed, but we don't have to. We're at a crossroads right now and we don't have to go the way other societies went. Let me make that clear. For having laid out a pattern of collapse that we seem to be on, you can hear it in my voice that I'm very cheerful because, uh, because we have technology now that will allow us to predict what the next disruption is and what the next danger is. And by that, what I mean is, is that we're collecting so much more data than we ever had in, in the history of humankind. And when you start to look at patterns in that data, we're becoming more and more accurate in terms of predictive analytics and using artificial intelligence. When you have millions and millions of data points, it eventually isn't that difficult to predict what the next data point's going to be. We have quadrillions of data points. So we're getting very, very good at knowing what the next event is, is going to be, and we're becoming increasingly more accurate. The example, and, and again, you know, you point to politics. I'm completely apolitical. I'm a scientist, and so I, I don't play politics and, or preference on either side of the aisle. And I want to say that because, because many times I have to search myself for an example that somebody won't immediately position me as conservative or a liberal immediately. So, But here's one example we can use, and that's the GOES weather satellite. I think we, weather's still a safe place <laughs> for scientists to talk about as an example. Yeah, the GOES weather satellites were launched last year, and they're giving us 10 times better resolution and 10 times the data than we used to have on weather events. So you can imagine 
right? Even if you're not a mathematician, the, the impact that that's going to have on being able to evacuate people prior to uh, severe electrical storms, flooding, hurricanes, you know, uh, these kinds of weather events. The example I use here, I I'm happen to be on the coast of Oregon right now. And I will tell you that when I first bought my, uh, I bought my second home up here, when I first got it, uh, they told me that we'd have a three minute warning before a tsunami hit. And they said, you should pack a go bag and, and make preparations. And I thought three minutes, how far am I going to get in three minutes? I own a dog. I'd have to get him in the car. And I, and I pretty much just threw up my hands and said, you know, you got to give me more than three minutes. Well, that time frame now is between 12 and 14 minutes or 15 minutes. I don't know. It's always getting longer. That that much I can tell you. And now it's at a point where I do keep a go bag because if you can give me 15 minutes, I can get to higher ground. I got a shot at surviving. I may not make it, but I'm going to give it a good shot. So all of these technologies are moving at an exponential rate at being able to protect human beings. And we have to remember that nobody is more conscious of using predictive analytic models than Wall Street right now. They want advanced warning that a country's currency is going to collapse or hyperinflation is going to kick in. And by using all of this data that we've amassed, they're able to predict with very, very good accuracy what events are going to come down the pike. The example I think I, I gave you in an earlier conversation we were having was a, a, a company up in, I believe it was in Sweden, but it was a, in a Scandinavian country that about, you know, I don't know, 12, 15 years ago predicted the Arab Spring was going to occur, only collecting data that was available publicly. They didn't require any private data at all. They were able to take all that data that was available publicly and they were able to predict the actual month that the Arab Spring was going to occur. And you can believe that the U.S. CIA was all over that company. Their, their name is Recorded Futures. Um, they were all over them to, to help them with more data, as was Wall Street and, you know, and the large financial institutions. So we don't have to go the way that other civilizations went. We can see what's coming and we can act in the present to avert that. I'm sorry, you can hear my dog in the background there. <laughs> oh, that's nothing to apologize for. I've got my dog sleeping behind me. She's just not loud right now. Dogs are welcome on this podcast. I think that's interesting to think about, too, how we can empower ourselves to move forward uh, with all of this data and information that previous societies would not have had when they were on the verge of collapse. Now we have the opportunity to use this data and these tools in order to shape a future that looks better than the trajectory that we might be on today, uh, which really, um, well, of course, as many of my listeners know, is a big point of the podcast here is trying to get people to go out and help shape the future. That means all of you. Uh, but here's this opportunity we have to leverage all of this data and information in a way that really empowers us to shape a future that's better for all of us. That's right. I mean, I call this pre-adaptation. I think the days of adapting to disruption it's just too risky and you can't turn on a dime. Most organizations, most nations can't turn on a dime. So they find themselves very, very vulnerable when these big disruptions occur. I believe in pre-adaptation. I believe we've, we've crossed over some threshold here where we can see what's coming and we can act in the present to either thwart the danger or eliminate it altogether. At the very least, prepare for it. So with that foresight comes great power. And, uh, and so I don't think we need to be fearful of change so much as we need to get ahead of it. And this is what I think the new modern leader has to be sensitive to, is you don't want to prepare yourself necessarily to be able to meet the change. You want to either be the change or get out ahead of the change. And that's what pre-adaptation is. And in my book, uh, On the Verge, I sort of lay out some of the principles of pre-adaptation. What are the methods in nature and laws that allow organisms to adapt to sudden and severe changes in the environment? And I think that those are transposable to organizations and, and societies as well, because there's no secret 
to how organisms survive when the environment suddenly changes. We know what that is. And so those principles applied really allow any organization to be able to predapt ahead of uh, an event. The point is to take action before the fact. Absolutely. That opportunity for organizations to shift from being primarily reactive to that place where they can be proactive and think ahead to what are the things they need to prepare for in the future or potentially what actions do they need to take in order to shape that future that they envision for their organization or for people. Yeah. And I'll give you a good example. You know, COVID-19 wreaked a lot of havoc for a number of reasons, but one of the reasons is there was a tremendous over-reliance on all companies on just-in-time inventory, JIT. We, we kind of got used to this idea that you could order something and it would be there, the exact number and the exact thing you ordered overnight. And so that really looked good on the financial bottom line because you want your money working for you. And inventory isn't money working for you. It's money sitting in a warehouse. And so you saw these superstores like Walmart, suddenly that back room where, you know, they were storing things uh, that they could put back out onto the main floor, that disappeared because Walmart would scan a, a can of tomato soup and that information, scanned information, would go to the distributor for Campbell's Soup and they'd say, we need, you know, 142 cans of tomato soup delivered tomorrow morning to the back of store X so we could replenish the shelf. And so we got to this point where even hospitals were relying on just-in-time inventory for critical items like ventilators, right, and PPE. And so, you know, we learned an important lesson, and that is how about asking questions like, what if just-in-time inventory doesn't work anymore? You know, what's our idea for that? How are we going to handle that? Well, just asking that one question would have forced people to say, you know, we can't treat ventilators like cans of tomato soup. Some things have to be inventoried. We got to bite the bullet financially, right? And so in that way, or create a situation where there's a stockpile state by state or federally, or that there's an exchange program worked out. I know in Oregon, we shipped a a bunch of ventilators to New York because we didn't need them. Guess what? We're shooting up now and New York's need for ventilators is down. And Cuomo said, well, we'll ship them back to you. But I don't think that we've had the need yet. But it'll be interesting to see if Cuomo keeps his promise and sends those ventilators back to Oregon or whether Oregon, uh, the Oregon governor was a sucker. We just don't know. But what my point is, is just in time, inventory became so attractive financially that we didn't discriminate between a can of tomato soup at Walmart and a ventilator in a hospital, right? Because the bottom line was financially, it was better for that organization. But I think that we've learned an important lesson now. We've learned that, hey, some things have to be inventoried and you got to bite the financial bullet. And that's what I mean about predapting. We can get out ahead of the need of inventory, get out ahead of the need for PPE, get out ahead of the need for swabs. Get out ahead for the need of quick quick vaccine science and quick vaccine production, distribution, approvals, so on and so forth. Oh, goodness. Yeah. And there's so many opportunities for pre-adaptation when you think about um, what organizations might face or things that organizations need to think about in the future, but also just society. Like I was just reading all the research that's come out recently in relation to the population decline. I think over the years, many of us have heard so much about worrying that the resources were going to be depleted to the point because the population was increasing so exponentially. And now we're talking about an opposite conversation about what if certain countries reduce their population by half by the end of the century. Um, Wow. Different conversations about um, what what we need to do to predapt to prepare for those uh, potential outcomes. Exactly. I mean, mean, it used to be that there were people inside of companies that would imagine they would they would come up with scenarios right and help to prepare the company for those scenarios part of that scenario management process used to be i remember we used to have to write out 5 and 10 and 20 year business plans and i and and the other day i was i was talking to a colleague of mine i've never mentioned this before but i 
I was talking to a colleague of mine and I said, what if you were designing a million year company? I mean, just from scratch, you were just taking a, a white sheet of paper and you said, a company that could last and be successful for a million years would have these attributes. Would it look like the company that we have today? And he had been, you know, the head of, uh, of the business school of very prestigious uh, university. And he said to me, that is a really good question that would make for a fantastic book. What would a million, you know, if you were trying to put together a company that your primary goal was to be successful for a million years, what would it look like? And it certainly would get rid of a lot of those short-term decisions that you're making. It sure would. Uh, Because there's a lot of things you'd have to think about. What are those potential outcomes in a million years? So many different things could happen, but it really comes down to what you talked about, being able to pre-adapt to potential outcomes, but also being able to be nimble and be able to adjust according to new trajectories or, you know, new information as you learn over time. So that's a, that is a fascinating question. It it is. I don't have an answer for it, by the way. I, I like to just ask myself questions just to get my thoughts squared away. And it's been haunting me now. I've been asking myself how a one million year company would look different from the companies I work with today and what kinds of attributes it would have that are different. And I I don't have I don't have an answer for you, but I think it's an interesting question. Yeah. Fascinating. I think it's something that that many leaders can probably ask themselves because I think even just the asking of that question gets you to think differently about the persistence of your organization uh, versus thinking about it from like a three to five year strategic plan to your point. That's right. I think, you know, part of this is the fact that you've got to put out quarterly earning reports, you know, for for public companies. There's a tremendous amount of pressure for their financials to look good so that they can maintain stock value and you know, there's 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 a whole machinery that that keeps companies looking at shorter and shorter term uh, objectives than than looking out longer term, and that's pretty difficult because it really doesn't lead to long term investment. But you know, I think that if they focus on survivability out to a million years, then I think it it really changes some of the shorter term decisions that any company you know would make. And uh, and I'm, I'm, I always applaud those companies that, you know, are willing to take a hit on Wall Street in the short term because they know they have belief from the leaders of the company uh, that the investments they're making over the long term. I this, you know, even though Elon Musk is a bit of a wild card, he certainly doesn't shy away from long term investment. And uh, those long term investments tend to pay off. Same uh, with Richard Branson. You know, there are some some uh, people, some individuals that have stepped outside of the quarterly earning pressures, <laughs> you know, and, and, and they're mavericks, you know, and they certainly have interesting personalities, uh, but they're doing the work that I don't see any reason corporations can't do. Yeah, because they remain somewhat fearless to that short term risk uh, with the benefit of long term potential outcomes. So Elon Musk is relatively impulsive, and that might be part of the dynamic that actually works quite well for him. But being able to assume those short-term risks and being able to take those risks in ways that other companies just won't do, um, but realizing huge benefits. I mean, he just sent people up into space, which is fascinating in and of itself. But even just look at the Hyperloop and you know beyond Tesla and so forth. Uh, some of the things that he's looking at are highly disruptive opportunities to really kind of shift course on some of the things that we're doing here in society, which is just fascinating. But from my standpoint, I look at it and I I think Elon Musk didn't have any idea that we didn't know was inevitable. We are going to colonize the moon. We are going to colonize other uh, environments. I mean, it's natural. And in order to do that, you got to be able to move cargo, right? Actual building materials at a cheap cost back and forth, you got to shuttle those, the, that cargo. And so effectively he's building the transcontinental railway. If you think about it and the people that built the railway, uh, it's not like they didn't make money. They were the wealthiest people in the U S for a period of time. So you, you have to think about it. He's just building the transcontinental ra- railway to the moon, right. And then to Mars. And so it's, it's inevitable that you have to be able to move cargo right? Transportation of cargo is just a basic building block of progress. 
And so, you know, I, I don't know. I mean, the technology to do it is very difficult. Uh, I'll give them that. But the idea of being able to get out ahead of where society is, I, I think that was it was pretty obvious where we needed to go. And we weren't going to be able to do it on the space shuttle. The space shuttle wasn't designed to move cargo at an inexpensive cost. Yeah, it, it really is an, an inspiring story when you think about it from that perspective. I don't want to be too Pollyannish about it, but it, it kind of erases some of the constraints that we feel exist out in the world in relation to some of the disruptive things that we can do or have the potential to do when we think about it in the terms of um, our history as people, what we've been able to achieve in the past and the remarkable kind of rise of different types of technologies or transportation over time. And here we are at this point in time where we can continue uh, those trajectories um, into an, a very interesting future without the standard mental boundaries I think we place on ourselves and what we can achieve as people. Well, the transportation of goods and people has always been essential to progress. You think about Charles Lindbergh being you know, able to fly across the Atlantic Ocean and how critical that was, you know, for goods and services being able to transport to Europe. So, you know, that was very, very important. Uh, and you think about shipping lines opening up and you think about the transcontinental railway and how that, you know, brought more people and more goods to the West Coast of the United States uh, and all along the way through the Midwest at certain towns and, and ports. So the, the transportation of goods and services has always been critical. So I don't think you can go wrong, right? But the point is, you know, how much investment do you want to make toward that future? And what part of it do you want to hope to capitalize on? So I think the idea is one that has occurred historically over time and paid off over time. Again, the technology is what you really have to dig into. What kind of technology do we have today? And whenever you're developing anything that's innovative, it always looks like Swiss cheese. There's parts that are developed and parts that aren't. You know, probably enough parts that you think it's feasible but along the way, you're going to have to actually invent some things <laughs> to fill in those holes. That's right. It just reminds me of a, we used to have an analogy in one of my previous teams that we called it our stack of cheese. And so even if each piece of Swiss cheese had holes in it, if you stack them all up, eventually there'll be a block of cheese that you can work with. Yeah, and that's really how it goes. I mean, people think, oh, well, you know, all you do is you take this technology and this science and you put it all together and and, and everything, but everything doesn't develop at the same time. And so this is the difficulty with progress is that you might have, you know, 80% of what you need, but the other 20% is a lot harder to invent. That's why it hasn't been invented, you know, and this is where a lot of startups get hung up. They see the core building blocks of what needs to be developed. And then they don't really understand or appreciate the degree of difficulty to get those last pieces in alignment. I think one of the things I've really enjoyed about this conversation is you've weaved in a lot of great kind of optimistic uh, thoughts and viewpoints about where we're headed in the future, which I think given kind of where we're at today, when you talk about and with with joy about the potential for collapse based on uh, some of the things we're experiencing, but still finding the ability to be optimistic about the future, I think is refreshing, but I think it's also um, hopefully empowering to folks to think about their own ability to do something to shape a better future from where we're at, or we've got a future to look forward to. Well, our greatest evolutionary inheritance is our frontal cortex of our brain. And the fact that we can imagine scenarios, other animals can't do that. They can't imagine scenarios and then pick the one that is most beneficial and most likely to occur. So we're able to imagine scenarios, work through imaginary solutions, imagine the obstacles, and then do something to change the future. And no other living organism on the planet has that capability. It's what's caused human beings to rise to the top of the living pyramid, right? So I am very optimistic because now combine that with predictive analytics and artificial intelligence, and there's no reason that anything dangerous or threatening to our species or to an organization to or, or to an individual should ever occur. We're getting very close to uh, the point at which when an infant is born, being able to look at their DNA 
and tell them exactly what diseases they're genetically predisposed to and then avoiding them. Through genetic engineering, we can help them avoid many diseases which they're programmed to get and they won't get them anymore. I mean, you want to talk about predaptation. We have so many technologies that can head off uh, negative outcomes that it's a wonderful time to be alive. Hmm. I was going to ask you the question that I ask a lot of guests, which is what makes you concerned about the future? But I feel like this is an excellent place for us to stop. We can identify those things that concern each of us. But Ed, to your point, we've got this great opportunity to leverage these tools around us or what we've learned in ways to help us shape this better future and really have an excellent you know, opportunity to live a better life if we just take action. Absolutely. I agree with that. Awesome. Well, Rebecca Casa, this has been a fascinating and amazing conversation. Uh, Rebecca's books are The Watchman's Rattle and On the Verge. Um, maybe given the conversation here, she'll think about another book in relation to the million year company. I don't know, but what a fascinating conversation. So Rebecca Casa, thank you so much for joining me. Well, thank you again for having me. I really enjoyed it. In her career, Rebecca has explored some of the biggest problems that organizations and societies face. Her vast knowledge of human biology, behavior, and history provides a fascinating view into our tendencies, patterns of behavior, and inherent fears. This has allowed her to help the world's largest companies navigate the complexity and simplicity of the human experience in a way that allows them to better predict future possibilities. However, It also allows them to operate more effectively so that they can move forward to the forefront in preparing for and shaping what lies ahead. As she mentions, it's a great time to be alive. This is not to discount recent events, nor the challenges created by a global pandemic. The reason that this is a great time to be alive is because now more than ever, we have the opportunity to use vast amounts of data to look into potential futures and understand a bit more about what may lie ahead. This is not so we can sit back and wait for it to happen. It is so we can take action. This is as close as it gets to actually changing the future for the better. You do not need to be in a boat with no oars heading down the river towards the future. It's time for you to pick up an oar and shape your direction and use data to provide insights on where the rocks, alligators, and other barriers may lay ahead. We have the ability to shape the future more than we ever have. Why wouldn't we? Why wouldn't you? So, go on. Go help shape the future. To learn more about Rebecca Costa and her groundbreaking work, go to RebeccaCosta.com. That's RebeccaCosta.com. If you're sorting through how to shape the future that you envision, subscribe to the Vivid Spring newsletter at VividSpring.com. You'll keep up to date with upcoming episodes of Humans Now and Then and be among the first to have access to tools training, and workshops so that you can be successful in shaping the future that you envision. I'm Rebecca Scott, and this has been Humans Now and Then, hosted and produced by Rebecca Scott. Resources and notes for this episode can be found at humansnowandthen.com. Thank you for listening.